Hey guys, I am Pastor Lynn Hansen, and I'm glad to be sharing with you in our life groups this week. We're talking about life in the jungle, and we're talking about the truth about living like hell. And uh, if it sounds like a rough title, it's because we wanted it to sound like a rough title. Because the jungle is the most dangerous place on earth. Uh, you know, hands down, the jungle is the roughest place on earth. The food chain dictates life in the jungle. And the life expectancy of, of most creatures in the jungle is not very high. A lot of us have this same mentality when it comes to life, kill or be killed. And we're really living the same way. We're living with this jungle mentality, survival mentality at any price. And, uh, you know, that's what God, I believe, was talking about in Proverbs 6 and verse 16, where he says, There's six things that the Lord hates, no seven he detests. Pretty unusual to hear God saying that he hates something. But what it comes down to is this, God hates what hurts you. And so he lists out seven things there that really hurt you and keep you stuck in your jungle, keep you stuck where you're at. Now I'm fully aware that there are some people who are going to be stuck in their jungles even when we're done with this. But I'm also aware that God's Word has the opportunity and, and the power to free people from the jungles that they're stuck in. And so I'm going to re remain excited about this, and I'm going to remain optimistic about this, that we can actually move forward uh, from the places that we've been stuck for, for, for however long we've been stuck there. And so the story that we're going to look at in our life groups this week teaches us about one of those seven things that keeps us in the jungle, and that's destruction. You might remember it saying, hands that kill the innocent. And, you know, some of us go around with this mentality so much so that uh, we're destructive in order to try to be constructive in life. And so, if you know, even if you're the most religious person uh, on the face of the planet, you get trapped in your own jungles, and the way that you do that often is by having destructive hands. The way that you accomplish things uh, in operation in day-to-day -day life is really destructive and not constructive. Well, there's three components uh, to storying that we do in our life groups. There's tell, retell, and rebuild. And I, so I'm going to tell you the story, or actually kind of read it to you from Matthew 18, verse 22. And uh, this story is all about this destructive hand disease that some of us have in this life. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy times. What's he talking about there? Well, Peter had just asked him, how many times should we forgive? Seven times, and Jesus says, no, not seven times, but seventy times seven. So, uh, part of the problem that we have with destructive hands many times is that we are carrying grudges, that we are carrying bitterness in our hearts. And it may be even from years past, it may be from things that happened, uh, you know, years and years ago, maybe even as children, but the thing is, we carry that with us and we approach life with this jungle mentality because we've never really dealt with that. We've never really forgiven. Verse 23, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants, as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Um, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he, his wife, and his children, and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees and before him, he said, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Hmm. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, about a hundred bucks, and he grabbed him and began to choke him, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, 
They were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. When the master called, then the master called his servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured then uh, until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now, uh, retell this story if you would please. Um, you choose who's going to retell the story and, and put down your notes or your Bible or whatever you have and retell the story. The rest of you follow along and look carefully at your notes or your Bible and, and let them know what it is that they missed after they've finished. Go ahead and, and retell and then rebuild the story. Would you please? Alright, if you've retold the story and then rebuilt the story by going around, here's some discussion questions. Uh, number one, first discussion question. Th this story is a parable. It's a story that Jesus told to uh, teach us a very powerful truth about how things work in life. And uh, it's so important that we get a hold of it. God has great purpose in having it in the Bible. And I think that it has a lot to say to us today. What do you think the primary meaning of the story is? What do you see as being the, the, the powerful primary meaning? of this story. Go ahead and talk about that. Alright, uh, question number two. First let me say this. When you're looking at a parable, probably the most important uh, thing that you can do to understand a parable properly is to identify the figures in the story. Who, who are the characters? Who are the people uh, represented in the story? Question two, identify these following characters in the story. You'll see them on your outline as well. Who are these people? The king in the story, who does he represent? The man who owed the king, who does he represent? The 10,000 talents, what does that represent? Verse 24, one of the uh, fellow servants, uh, what does he represent? Verse 28, and uh, 100 denarii at verse 28, what does he represent? What does that represent? Excuse me. And the other servants in verse 31, what does that represent? Go ahead and talk about that, please. Identify each of these characters. Well, in case you uh, missed any of those or uh, you're not quite sure about them and we want to have a stepping stone to move on, so I'm going to go ahead and identify those. The king... Uh, obviously represents God, you know, uh, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, uh, Revelation 19. So uh, God is the King, Jesus is the King in the story. A man who owed the King, well that could be anyone. How about the uh, 10,000 talents at verse 24? That's representative of what we would call a sin debt that can never be repaid. You say, well what's a sin debt? This is an offense that's so large uh, to God, an offense to Him that we have committed that is so large that uh, if it were a dollar value, it's equal to um, thousands of lifetimes of hard labor and we couldn't pay it back. He couldn't pay it back. So it's simply totally impossible to repay, and that's the point of that. Now, one of the fellow servants there at verse 28 again could be anyone that hurts or offends you. And so. Uh, you know, somebody that rubs you the wrong way, um, ignores you, or just steps on your bruised emotional toes. Could be anything, anyone. A uh, hundred denarii at verse 28 is similar uh, in, in, a, in this way. It's a smaller, less significant debt, um, a sin debt, owed to a person. Somebody has offended. And uh, it's equal to a hundred days wages. And so it's entirely payable. Um, a person is able to pay this one back. It's repayable. The other servants in this story, I like this very much at verse 31, they could be anyone who has ever seen the damage of destructive hands. Or you might think of it this way, anyone who has ever seen injustice happen at the hands of empty, angry, 
egotistical people. And so, um, you know, if you've ever seen that, you could be one of the crowd. Um, with that in mind, question number three, look carefully, if you would, back at verse 28. Put your eye on verse 28. I'd like you to look at it very carefully. Um, hands that kill the innocent or relatively innocent at verse 28. Destructive hand disease at work right there at verse 28. Question, what was his motivation? Look deep into his heart here at verse 28. Look deep into his heart and uh, you know, here he is. He, he goes out, he finds one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, grabs him and chokes him. He says, pay me back. Now, you know, he has him thrown in a prison. He has all this stuff done to him. Look carefully as much as you can into his heart, or perhaps your own heart, and into his attitudes, perhaps your own attitudes. What did he... Wh why did he not care about the damage that he was doing? Why did he not care about the damage that he was doing, even after having been forgiven so much himself? Look deep in your own heart attitudes. Why did he not care about the damage he was doing, even after having been forgiven so much himself? Go ahead and talk about that, would you please? All right, well, look again, if you would, please, at the story. Look at verse 31. Put your eye on verse 31. His fellow servants saw the whole thing. His, his fellow servants saw everything that took place. And I love their reaction. There's, this is great teaching here. You know, Jesus, the master teacher, really can open your eyes here. Can you imagine what could have happened at this point with these fellow servants? They saw the whole thing. The whole deal of, you know, poop kind of running downhill could have continued with them. These servants could have said, you know, oh, I see, well, that's how life works. Well, I better get mine while I can. And, and then each of them go out with destructive hands and uh, find someone else that they have a problem with and, uh, you know, choke the, the, the debt out of them. Make them pay. Keep them in their prison. But what happened instead? What happened instead? Instead of deciding that life's not fair or I'm going to get mine, they went to the king. You know, when life hurts, think about this. Now, when life hurts and it feels like you need to choke someone... Don't go home and kill the innocent. Don't go to church and kill the innocent. Don't go kick the dog. Don't take it out on someone. Go to God. That's what His Word says to do. He says, cast your cares on me because I care for you. Now, if you have an active, real relationship with God, that's something you can do. Question number four. Who do you identify most with in the story? Who do you identify most with in the story? Go ahead and talk about that, please. All right, and of course, our last question, number five. As always, what impacted you most in the story? What was the gotcha moment in the story? What is it that hit you hardest, either in the discussion or in the story? And don't forget this, what will you do with it? The whole thing is a waste if there's not a what you're going to do with it. So uh, what was the gotcha moment and what are you going to do with it? Well, guys, have the rest of a great life group. And, uh, man, I'll see you soon.